Um, we're going to jump into it. Actually, um, Jeff is, is on the next talk, so stay where you are. Um, Jeff. Um, this is um, I2B2 using OMOP for the All of Us Research um, Program. And uh, he will be joined by Natalie Boutin, who's the IT director and the program director for uh, Mass General Brigham Hospital. So I will, I will let you guys take it away. Thanks. Uh, Natalie, I think you're going to kick it off. Or can I you have, let me there share you. my screen. Right. All right. Can you all see my screen? Mm, yeah. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Natalie, Natalie Boutin. I work with Sean and uh, Jeff at Mass General Brigham. And I also work with um, John Wilbanks at the All of Us Research Program. So I'm going to power through just a few slides on the context of what the All of Us Research Program is. And um, as part of the program, we're transferring clinical data, EHR data, to the central All of Us program for then providing that data to investigator, investigators via tools that are becoming available. So since John had already provided a brief overview of what the All of Us program is about, I'm gonna be going through these slides extremely quickly. Um, so the All of Us research program is an extremely large research program to gather information and samples from more than a million people. It is a program that started enrolling people um, three years ago now um, and is about a quarter there in terms of getting a million core participants. Um, so ultimately, the purpose, one of the purposes, I should say, not just the purpose, is to foster research. There are other purposes as well in terms of community building and others as well. Um, but some of the research questions that the program wants to address span all kinds of research from, um, you know, looking at risks that people have, um, looking at treatments, um, and one of the key things about the All of Us research program that is different maybe from other research that at least this group is involved in is that the data will be provided to not just academic researchers, but citizen scientists. And this will be done at the international level. So the idea is to create a, a resource that is going to be available to a very large number of people who might otherwise not have access to such a resource. Um, so one of the, the key components of the All of Us research program is that we're trying to build an extremely diverse cohort, in fact, the most diverse cohort that has ever been built in biomedical research. Um, there's also a diversity of different types of data that are being collected um, from the participants. Participants genuinely are partners. There are participants embedded in every facet of the program. And as I mentioned before, this will be a resource that is open and available to a very large number of people at the international level. It is national in scope. So we, I'm part of the New England Consortium, which is based out of the Boston area. There are other consortiums that are enrolling large numbers of people. These are in red in the slide. There are also federally qualified health centers, which are the ones in blue that are also enrolling participants um, in smaller numbers. And there are far more partners in this program than are represented in this uh, slide. It genuinely is an extremely large and extremely complex program with many people contributing their expertise. So in New England, we, we, are, we call ourselves, all of us New England, we're a consortium in collaboration with Boston Medical Center, and we're enrolling participants at most of the Mass General Brigham hospitals for community health centers that are affiliated with Mass General Brigham. We're also enrolling participants at Boston Medical Center main campus and two of the FQHCs that are affiliated with BMC. And our enrollment targets are, are very large. We're expected to enroll 
12,000 to 16,000 people per year. We're also expected to retain these people and keep them engaged, um, performing some kind of programmatic activity every 18 months. This is just a map that shows all of our enrollment locations in the greater Boston area. And so what we're asking people to do, so first they consent and they provide consent to participate in the program and a separate consent to transfer their EHR data. There are surveys built into the program. There are right now seven surveys that people can do. There are three required to become a core participant. Then three surveys become available after 90 days of participation. And then um, there's a COVID survey that went live in May that is being repeated every month for people, for participants to provide their information um, on, on, on COVID. And the name of that survey is COPE. Um, participants who come in to do their enrollment visit provide uh, blood or saliva samples as well as urine and physical measurements. Um, there's also integration with digital apps to provide additional data and soon another component of participation will be that participants will be receiving genetic information back. So a huge part of what we do in New England and I thought it would be interesting for this audience to see this and, and Jeff will be talking about the data transfers in more detail but there is such a tremendous amount of work that goes into recruiting and engaging with people um, to enroll them, but also to stay engaged with them. So we have a team of 65 research coordinators and 10 managers just with the um, New England Consortium whose job is to engage with people in lots of different settings. Um, you know, we, we try to put, um, collateral about the program everywhere that we can in the community. You might have seen some of the bus ads that we've been running for the, the past year. We also did radio ads. Um, we host and participate in community events and we really try to drive community conversations and get the word out about the program, um, about health equity and, and about research. So it genuinely is, uh, a very large and complex program. In terms of the electronic health record and the data that we're, we're providing to the, the, the program, that includes demographics, visits, medications, laboratories. We're, we're not sending notes yet right now. We're also only sending metadata on notes, um, but the data set is going to be growing over time. And as of now, there's about 271 core participants. We did pause enrollment in mid-March for obvious reasons, and we're gearing up to start up again. We're not actually sure when for New England, but at the program level, the date right now is July 13th to start up again. And it is a very diverse cohort of research participants. Um, so we already went through that. So powering through the research tools. So right now you can get access to what's called the research hub, um, which is a data browser. So you can see information um, about participants that has been provided, but it's rolled up to a pretty high level. Um, certainly no individual level data. So the, the researcher workbench, which is the data tool that most academic researchers would be using, just became available in May in beta form and um, will become available, I think, later in the year to a larger number of people and will be going through enhancements over the next couple of years and beyond in terms of growing the data elements that are available through this workbench. So now in terms of how we're sending data to the program, there's two models at Mass General Brigham, or rather there were two models, um, and one is inactive right now, but could be turned on again in the future. There's Sync for Science, and there's the ETL model via OMOP, which is what Jeff is gonna talk about in a second. And so Mass General Brigham was one of the pilot sites for Sync for Science. And what that is, is that participants can indicate in their participant portal when they provide their consent, that they would like to contribute their EHR data via this program. 
and that takes them to the patient portal where they authenticate and sign off. And from there, there's a direct transfer of data to the program. There's a parallel workflow, which is the one we're using the most right now, um, whereby we start with the validation of participant identity. And I did want to specify this part of the process because it's such an important one and it's really laborious. So basically we do not send EHR data for anybody whom we haven't met in person. And we actually do require seeing a governmentally issued photo ID in order for us to check off that we're good to send the, the EHR data. There's then a second step, which is the definition of the patient list. And we actually do a second round of validation because we're very conservative with this stuff. And we compare the data that the participant entered into the All of Us tools with the data that exists in EPIC, in our, our clinical record. And based on whether there are some inconsistencies, we actually do not send the data for some people. So we, we are extremely conservative about deciding whose data um, is sent to the program. And we do work hard to resolve those inconsistencies so that we can send the data for everyone. But there's a lot of work that happens there to make sure that we're completely comfortable sending the data to the program. Um, so we're leveraging I2B2 to do the transformations. Um, before we send all of the EHR data to the All of Us program um, via Google. And Jeff is going to speak to the transformation process that we run through for the program. So that was my brief overview of the business context. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. Great. I'm going to try to steal presenter. Uh... Do you see my slides or my presenter view? Does any, can anyone yes, tell me? Yes, I, yes, we see them. Slides. slides, good, good, good. Perfect, uh, so now Natalie has talked about all the interesting things all of us is doing and I'm get to bore you with data transformations in I2B2. Uh, but I will highlight that this is, this is definitely, this portion of the talk is in the weeds, but it's very, very important and it's applicable not just to all of us, but to transforming data into any different analytic model. So we used a kind of a, a very similar approach um, in Pocornet when we were participating in Pocornet to get our data into the Pocornet common data model. And um, we were using this for other OMOP projects as well, not just all of us. And it's, uh, it's a tool that's a, it's applicable to any I2B2 instance, not just uh, what's happening at uh, Mass General Brigham. So maybe that's a hook that will keep you listening, even though this isn't nearly as exciting. Um, so, so the person does all of the things that Natalie talked about. They sign up, they go to a visit, they fill out questionnaires, they get their blood drawn, um, and then in this box is the data. Uh, they get entered into a patient tracking system. Uh, their data gets flagged in the data warehouse, and then it gets dumped out um, into an I2B2 data mart at um, Mass General Brigham or at our other sites in the New England HPO, uh, which is just Boston Medical Center and its affiliates right now. And then that gets transferred, translated into OMOP, and then that gets sent to a secure repository at uh, Verily, which is a company we, we all know and love, um, just because it's part of Google. Uh, okay, so I'm talking only about the red box here. The red box is, is just it has that one arrow in it. So how do we get from I2B2 to OMOP? So I2B2 has this great star schema data model that's super flexible. Almost everything gets plopped into a giant fact table. So you can put your diagnoses, your medications, your procedures, all in a fact table. Everything gets a row in the fact table. And then you have an ontology that gives context to what is in the fact table. So it provides information on the, name, the names associated with the codes, the relationships of those codes to other codes and other metadata about the codes. Uh, and I2B2, of course, can be uh, outfitted with many different ontologies. You can have the same data set running with different ontologies. So you can be running a, a Pocornet um, ontology and an ACT ontology and an I2B2 demo ontology all at the same time if you want to, if, you, if you're able to map that to your local codes in your ACT table. Uh, OMOP takes a different approach. It has more tables. Um, but really, when you dig into it, 
it's not all that different. So here's the procedure occurrence table and the condition occurrence table. And you'll notice that the table, the columns in those tables have different names, right? There's procedure concept ID and condition concept ID. But those are just concept IDs. Those all come from the OMOP concept dictionary, which is a, a vast curated dictionary of, of everything that OMOP would expect to see in its data. Uh, so, so really the tables are quite the same. There's a procedure date and a condition date, but th those are just dates. So at the end of the day, you can look at OMOP as just similar to a star schema, except it has many fact tables. Fact tables for specific situations, for conditions, for procedures. Um, and so I, I put the fact table and the procedure occurrence table uh, next to each other so you can kind of see how things might line up. I didn't draw all the little arrows on here, but you can see like there's a person ID which would line up with a patient num, a procedure concept ID which has some relationship to a concept code. And so all of these things kind of just, they match, they match together. Um, but lest you think that it's just about copying things from one column to another, there is some complexity. And that has to do primarily with the data mapping. Um, so you start with the I2B2 data model. This is a diagram that Sean and I developed uh, some time ago for Picornet, but it easily adapts to, uh, to OMOP transform. So in this example, we're using the ARCH uh, ontology, the ARCH information model, which defines everything that would, you would expect to find in this ontology and um, maps it all to the local data in the data model. You can use that ontology then, you can create these ontology driven data transforms that allows you to create a transform table based on the codes that the ontology, the ontology has a mapping from the local codes to the, uh, to the global codes and that allows you to output your uh, OMOP data model. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the newest version of the transform which is right now available in that GitHub but uh, if you Google, Google it, you will find it. And I can also give you the link again later. Um, so, the, so the process of this is creating a local mapping. So everyone who's implemented I2B2 has done this part in their local ontology. So up top in this example, you see part of the ACT COVID ontology that has, oh, I'm sorry, this is our local ontology, but it's a COVID test. It's a COVID PCR test. And so in your ontology table, you have uh, an entry for your COVID PCR test. And then you have child nodes that represent all of your individual local codes for COVID PCR tests. And this is, this is all uh, um, abstracted away in the ontology. So you can just drag over COVID PCR tests and it automatically pulls in all of the local children, which are the local codes. Uh, so to transform into a different data model, we augment this. And the newest version, we augment it with this standard code and standard domain column, which tells you, okay, this is 94309-2, which is the new LOINC code for a uh, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 PCR test. And it, it uses these standard codes to, um, to look up the local codes from the fact table. So you have these local codes in your fact table, they get looked up in the ontology, translated to standard codes, and then a further step of translation into OMOP is to translate the standard code into the OMOP number, which is a unique identifier assigned by um, Odyssey OMOP to identify that particular code in the standard terminology. And so that's, that's in a nutshell, that's how this is done. And I think, uh, five minutes left. So uh, I'll, I'll go through this slide. So this is, uh, you know, this is translating from the fact table to the measurement table. And you can see a lot of it is just copying data from different columns. But then there's the concept column, which is the very tricky one that requires some, some magic uh, that I've just gone through. There are more complex situations. I'm going to speed through these and um, take, take some questions at the end, maybe. But uh, modifiers are a trickier situation. Modifiers are not a thing in OMOP. Modifiers are additional columns, because remember, OMOP has all these additional fact tables. So for a drug exposure table, you, they just add a column for refills. Um, OMOP, uh, I2B2 does this in a generalizable way, where there's a modifier code. And you can define what those modifier codes represent using the ontology. So there would be a modifier code that would represent refills and there'd be an additional row in the fact table for that modifier. So that, that, that's a kind of a very different approach. So it creates a tricky, uh, technically tricky transformation. So we have this modifier configuration table, which uh, is, is kind of a new, a new feature. So you can define what paths in your ontology match up with different columns in the target table. 
And there, there can be a lookup in the ontology table that then lets you look things up in the fact table and translate things into OMOP. So you start with your uh, modifier configuration path. It says look up refills in with this path in the ontology. You find that that corresponds to this local code Rx refill. And then from the, in the fact table, you find Rx refill associated with a medication code. And then you can take the, uh, the number of refills and put that into the drug exposure table. So this, this portion of it is uh, still underway. It's partially completed for some domains and not for all domains yet. Um, but then one of the really tricky things is that OMOP and I2B2 think about their data differently. I2B2 likes to be a big data sponge. It likes to take in whatever you've got and make it browsable and searchable. And so it tries, it's very similar to the source data. OMOP wants to create things that a statistician can run statistics on and have the statistics be meaningful. So the, the, the kind of the, the way that is thought about is a little bit different. And in terminology that leads to um, things that don't quite line up. So this is a table that shows how things move from the, the blue columns at the top are source terminologies in I2B2. And the, uh, the heat map shows how things end up moving into OMOP tables. So you can see an ICD-10 uh, diagnosis, uh, I think that it's all, yeah, it's ICD-10 diagnosis, can end up it's typically a condition, but it can also end up as an observation or a procedure or a measurement or a device, depending on what makes the most analytical sense. Um, so it, it's really in some ways digested. And it's not just as simple as one code turning into a, a different code in a different table. That does happen. So you might see an ICD procedure code turning into a uh, SNOMED code in the condition table. So you move, uh, taking a procedure code and put it in condition. But you can also see things split into many codes. So like, there's one case I found that if you have a certain birth control pill, it ends up being five different drug codes that represent different possible ways of meaning that birth control so that any analysis will pick it up. So, so you have to account for that complexity of adding more data to the target model. Um, you can also, you also get these things where you get not only multiple terms, but terms that show up in different target tables, right? So obesity, for example, if it's a diagnosis for obesity, then you do get a diagnosis for obesity in the condition table, but you'll also get a term for obesity in the observation table because a statistical analysis might want to pick up all observations of obesity and doesn't want to think about how, how obesity is really a diagnosis. So this makes it easier when you're doing analyses later on, but it makes it very difficult to transform the data um, into uh, analyzable OMOP. Also, OMOP mappings tend to remove retired codes, especially for um, uh, copyrighted terminologies like uh, that aren't freely available, like CPT, which is another issue that we've run into. Um, but we're doing this. So the whole team has managed to uh, do this at Mass General. And here's just a screenshot of um, the Odyssey data quality tool, just kind of giving descriptive statistics of what's in the data. So you see there's people with a variety of ages and um, variety of races and both genders. And so we are getting data that actually makes sense. Um, and then I grabbed the screenshot just a second ago. This was, uh, while well, Natalie was talking, this is the All of Us data browser that she was talking about that uh, lets you browse the data that's aggregated from all of the sites in an obfuscated and uh, not site specific way. And I just thought I'd pull this up because it's kind of nice to see that you, you can, you actually have something that you can look at and you can go to this data browser, read.research.allofus.org and look at the things that Natalie was talking about. Um, and it's, it's a nice UI because it was written by Google software. Engine. Okay, I think I'm actually done. So I'm gonna stop there. I did, wasn't watching the, Thank you so much, um, Jeff and Natalie. That's, uh, that was a really terrific talk, and all this research is, um, is pretty exciting. I'm, I haven't heard a lot about it, so Natalie will have to get together and chat about it later. <laughs>